Well, good evening, uh, everybody. Welcome to uh, tonight's event. It's, it's great to see you, uh, albeit uh, virtually. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, to celebrate the launch of these three exciting uh, new poetry pamphlets. Um, of just a few words I want to say about the press itself, and then uh, each editor will introduce the, uh, the poets they've been working with. Uh, that's to say Les Robinson, who's been working with Daniel, uh, I've been working with Isabel, and Claire Cox has been Kostya's editor. Uh, each of us will give a short introduction to the poets we've been working with, and then the poet will read for about 15 minutes uh, before we wrap up by eight o'clock. Um, as I said, the press is based at uh, Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre, which conducts research into poetry, a uh, very wide range of poetry, um, and teaches poetry both about it and how to write it um, in our creative writing programmes at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. So if you're at all interested, please do look up the Brooks website and find out more about it. Uh, we also run an international poetry competition, which some of you might have entered. Uh, there were two categories every year, open and English as an additional language. And we recently announced this year's winners um, and shortlisted poets. And in fact, we'll actually be holding another online event uh, which uh, will run much more smoothly than this uh, on the 19th of November. Um, at which the winning poets will read and also the judge uh, Fiona Benson. So please do come along to that if you can. It's open to everybody regardless of whether you entered the competition or not. Um, you can find out lots more about the census activities on our website um, and if you're not already following us on social media please do. We are at Brooks Poetry, B-R-O-O-K-E-S Poetry um, and we're on uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Um, Ignition Press itself was established in 2017 with the aim of being a press with an international outlook that publishes original arresting poetry from emerging poets. Uh, we published our first pamphlets, some of you may know, by uh, Lily Blacksall, Mary Jean Chan and Patrick James Errington in 2018. Since then we've published 14 pamphlets, including the most recent three, and two of those, A Hurry of English by Mary Jean Chan and Hinge by Alicia Pia Mohammed, uh, have been Poetry Book Society pamphlet choices. Alicia's in the summer earlier this year. You can buy all the pamphlets um, that remain in print, including, of course, those by Isabel, Daniel and Kostya in uh, Oxford Brooks's online shop. And you'll find a link to that shortly in the YouTube um, chat box. Um, or you can just look up the Poetry Centre website and click on the Ignition Press uh, link. We will post them out to you as soon as we possibly can. There's a bit of a, a lag at the moment with the uh, issues around the pandemic, uh, but we try and get them out to you as soon as we possibly can. So it's almost time for me to hand over to Les to introduce Daniel, first of our poets. But before I do that, I just want to say very many thanks to Claire Cox, uh, who works with me at the Poetry Centre, not only for uh, looking after some of the behind the scenes stuff uh, at the launch today, but also for all of her tremendous work uh, with the Poetry Centre and the press. Really, without all her, her knowledge and expertise and very hard work, uh, we wouldn't be able to run the projects that we do. So thank you, Claire. Uh, I also want to say, finally, a very big thanks to Les Robinson, uh, who you'll hear from in a minute, our managing editor of the press, whose sage advice and counsel uh, has always been essential in allowing the press to thrive. Um, finally, many, many congratulations to our three poets. Uh, it's been a real privilege to work with them and for us to publish their poetry. And I'm sure people are going to really enjoy hearing from uh, them this evening and indeed reading the pamphlets. If you'd like to offer some enthusiastic words of support, feel free to add them to the YouTube chat box. Um, which you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. So uh, without further ado, enjoy the readings and now over to Les to introduce Daniel Fraser. <clears throat> okay, hi. Um, I'm very pleased to, well, hello everybody. Um, this is a bit unusual for me at my age, this technology stuff, but we'll get there. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce the first of the latest batch of three pamphlets. Um, and I, we first noticed Daniel's poetry in the London Magazine Poetry Competition, as we did with Alicia Pirmahamid. And as Neil has mentioned, um, her pamphlet became PBS Pamphlet Choice. So there's no pressure, Daniel, on you, no pressure at all. Um, as an accomplished poet, Daniel was quite rightly has his own mind when it comes to his own work. But he was very careful and thoughtful in the editing process as we steered the pamphlet towards publication. The editing discussions actually were carried out on the phone during the first lockdown. Fortunately, we never had to revert to the dreaded Zoom. Okay, the book, the pamphlet, which is actually really good. Um, the poems in Long Iron have a physicality of landscape, 
exploring our place as human beings in the economies of nature and history. The poems are immersive, thriving in the uncertain space between the natural and industrial, somewhere akin to what Paul Farley describes in his book Edgelands with Michael Simmons Roberts, a wilderness that is neither town nor countryside, a place in between, a place ignored, but a place encountered, all recorded here in this brilliant collection. Tonight's launch is the start of what I believe will be a really successful poetry career and one that I'll be pleased to follow. So I'm very brief, but please I hand over now to hear Daniel read from the pamphlet. Um, thanks uh, for that and uh, thanks for everyone who's come to watch and uh, thanks uh, to all of Ignition Press, Claire and Neil and especially Les for editing the book. Um, it was so nice to have someone other than myself to argue with about line breaks and uh, questionable verbs. Um, so, um, and thanks most of all to uh, Kostya and Isabel. Um, I feel like uh, each new poem that gets made uh, is in a conversation with all the other poems that have ever been written. And um, I'm glad that ours are gonna get to speak together this evening. Um, so this first poem is uh, named after the uh, line on the London Overground that I used to live next to. It's called Gospel Oak to Barking. Is there a line more suited to the disenchantment of the world? The rumble of truth's winged oaks torn mad by the braying dogs of modernity. Weber reconfigured by logistics, trapped and signed west to east progress that follows its own lie into the clipped lawns of the suburban sunrise. Don't get mythic, the man in the lemon polo implies, reading his tattoo out loud. Dream as if you'll live forever, live as if you'll die today, wrapped blue around a rose. His tackled, tasseled moccasins catching drips from bags swollen with the goods of an anonymous grocer. Headphones and flower print leaking music. Electronic are somehow both angular and soft. The tongue shape of boca or trigonometry performed in crayon. Our exit reached, we descend from the overground into the fragile tumult. Yanis footed haringey trundles along, stuck somewhere between second and third. Like Virgil, only licensed to stand at the edges of the sky. On green lanes, McDonald's and Argos vie for lumens, and the mattress store's neon dreams offer nothing but a place to rest. A man in a three-piece sequin suit, hair brocaded with shells, buys a knockoff Disney princess made of Victoria sponge, her arms pierced by candles, a wounded aerial deflated as Sebastian. The pavement kicks with warp fruit, kebab meat, and promises of hot nuts. A Kurdish anarchist plays the accordion, doling out film scores for the hair netted cooks folding shop front dough. Cheese, lamb and spinach parceled into grease paper, sent leeching onto the poorly counseled road. Tar spots clumped and chewy, the soft darkness walking with us along the park where a row of poplars turns untended silver on the breeze. On our street, sparrows and starlings bathe their wings in the gutter, flicking back to nests cloaked above estate agents and franchise coffee, harbingers of high rent and dislocation. By the corner, a woman hands out papers for her new congregation. The name on the leaflet is Madame Zender. Hear the words of Christ, three pounds. Tea leaves read just five pounds a cup. Inquiries regarding salvation also permitted. Um, and uh, this next poem is called Winter Window. Evening gone, lost in afternoon's gullet, the torn pages of the sky, gray slopes folding through mottled fog frail air thickened by a cowardly light. Farms spread their lamps onto the meadow, blue ponds seed with foam. Tomorrow lies down low in the churchyard, ice scuff branches separate dusk from dusk. Pigeons clad the December eaves, ticks and feathers smear Gethsemane's bough. 
The window leaks its ancient color, eyes glassy and harlequined with lead. Dark leaves gather around a lone alder, blanketed by snow. Out among the reeling gulls, a tired bell rubs salt into the wind. We turn away, draw the curtains in the room, the cold world gone, bodies lost to one another's heat, hands and mouths settled in the hollows, in the soft pressures we call home. There in the sleep of shadowed cloth, the mark of winter, rasped and burly at the throat, shrivels into the smoothest ember of a voice. And uh, this next poem uh, is dedicated to the poet uh, Karen Solly. Uh, it's called Robert Mitchum, and uh, it opens with a quote from Walter Benjamin. A storm is blowing in from paradise. Backward angel, carrying a love-hate mouth to match the hands, pumping gas on highway asphalt, your tarry brawn pushing my tongue around North American language, diner cheeks, eyes at sunset, chin half cut, a sickle carving out two faces, both turned away from good, smoke drifting over lowered lids, too tranquil for the sting of rhythm, every shot a drawl, a question, framed as if to say what next. History's a mugs game, making moves behind our backs, but one you'll play again for a chance to get clean of these dead sentences. Words and voices that haunt the canyon. Wheels spinning back to catastrophe. All those spectres blowing silver through the pines. And uh, so this is a poem that I uh, wrote for my grandma, uh, Mary. Uh, it's called Change of Knowledge. Mary, some days you only come here to open my heart to death, to show how one February frost might corrode an old world just as a finger snaps against a thumb. Your white crown always an inscription of the soil, each slow grace of your hands an indulgence withdrawn, like a gift grief keeps on giving. It was on a cold hill where a black church stood beside another, the stone ruined by two long centuries of smoke. Lung cancer spread, just gone 76. The earth turned down to a deep bed, laid over with rope and rough cloth. School uniform, the one smart thing I could muster. Warm sky, dressed in winter cliche. Gray clouds roaming gray over gray. The white sun hollowing a silverish decline. The priest tried to teach me to trust all unspeakable things to God while I was lost in the descent of roses, soaked through by dull prayers of mud. The coffin lending you a weight you never could have carried on your own. Today the wind to drips and sags through its barren music, the toneless sky and slop of scum running in the ditches, clogged with these tissues of meaning, the recrudescence of a single day left behind decades of dark wood, of rain. Um, so uh, this next poem is called Sertia, and uh, it's the first poem from the book. A shirtless man with a black mohawk is raking dry leaves across the road, her name tattooed on his spine letters a foot high, blue dunghill lip hung and peeling, the uncaring lilt of decades pulling at that sweet smoke, the pleasure of destruction transfigured over muscle. Your back creaks like a knife discolored in the body of a whale, a beaching of something ancient on a cold Atlantic shore, the carving of sorrow into sustenance. I want to know what broken bond what gasp of newborn breath could inaugurate this ink? Instead, our mouths lay soft as straw across the threshold of a speech left quietly alone, 
share eat eyes sharing a look that says promises that says we are the rough bodies that know these afternoons the blunt keepers of words thickened into sinew i say thank you to the rays that burned us into being and to her the great shadow gathered up into this testament of skin um so this next poem um is uh, kind of about uh, creating the world's uh, smallest and crummiest utopia and then not going there. Um, it's called An Imagined Visit to the Pencil Museum. Um, as you've probably guessed, I've never been, but this is not the time to quibble with existence. I'd arrive the night before, of course, driving northward in the dusk light and check into my top-notch B&B chosen for its five-star rating, antique features, and several comments stressing both comfort and dear repose. The next day I'd stroll beneath the pencil pines, admiring their gray needles and the fluted shavings they use instead of leaves. Next I'd scuttle through the graphite mine, the soft caves of smudge and glint, where I could write my name in stalactites and touch the weeping walls feeling my skin erase the thinnest surface of the dark. After they'd shown me the pencils carved from moonlight and those extinct reptiles whose teeth can serve as glue. Last of all, I'd do the gift shop, shedding my gold coins with a plum, half a kilo of licorice crayons, 12 kinds of mechanical lead. Even Paul, the three foot talking pencil, who whimpers hold me when you squeeze his hand and the resin statue, a small facsimile of the last great sharpening tournament of 1992. In the car I'd be exhausted, scuffed wild in carbonic joy. Paul and I would have fun talking with sunlight cross hatching through the cloud. We'd stay there late, watching the sky edge down to a blue plumbago, shade chewing the corners where the car park met the wood both fearful of the drive before us along the dark and windings of the road and back into the nowhere I began. Um, so this is uh, my last poem um, and it's also the last poem in the book. Um, and uh, it's called Hebden Bridge. Um, Uh, it's named after the town in uh, Yorkshire that I'm from, um, and it's a place that still has a very deep connection to me, both good and bad. Um, wool skies turn over heavy cloud. The pages of a good book stuck somewhere between wickedness and flood. A gurgle of rain meadows, pitches unfit for sport. Long hedgerows littered with chapsticks, cider bottles and damp tubes of old fireworks. Their excitements decidedly past tense. This is the place you still call home, an answer arrived at just by asking the wrong question too many times. The landscape an impossible pattern of fields, dry stone and cart tracks, brickwork lines tangled around dark farms. Terraces milled in childish strokes of grit, raw edged and smoky. The canal churns through creaking locks, bleak with weed and fat perch and reeds, where shadows of imported carp nudge blunt snouts through the thickened silt. Men sit, switching stories on damp canvas, still sunk low in the towpath one hand on the sandwich, another dipped in the red husks of maggots, the fresh bait struggling free, fluffed like rice, writhing too. Shop fronts boarded or bought up, shaken dry and franchised into nowhere, chrome and steel, exposed light bulbs, railway salvage, their high chairs polished by the acutest music. You can still buy crystals, eye talismans and stone webs for catching dreams. 
false promise as an orthodox practice strung out on silk. Commerce, the one sure way to heal the wounds that time has forced you into keeping. 15 pubs, three per thousand, more yesterday. Rooms where you can watch the same face age through its endless afternoons. Doorways hung with pretty chimes, wicker and knotted twigs. Scents of incense, marks of incest. Park benches warped in a fog of weed and needles. Out beyond the council blocks lie the sewage plant and dump. Broken dye work and coal silos. Industrial leftovers clump with white goods and rust. Jaws and iron arms crushing waste. Weary of reconstitution. Hold on. There are still the old mills, oak woods and carpets of bluebells. Mill ponds still with sediment and the great moors swept hard like a birthplace for the wind. The whole place picture perfect. Yes, a land where poetry comes easy. Skimming the dark crags and fattened beaches growing high above the river murk. Voices cheering, drowning out the yeasty spume and froth, brimming deep, lower even than the world. Thanks very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I love that uh, last poem in particular. If you want to find out more about um, Daniel's work and indeed Isabel's work, Costia's work, um, you can find it uh, details on, on the Oxford Books Poetry Centre website. Um, in fact, I, I've done a, uh, some interviews with each of the poets. So if you want to find out more about maybe the, the kind of genesis for some of these um, poems, please do uh, look them up. Um, so I'm going to introduce Isabel now, I'm very pleased to say. Um, it was a real pleasure working with Isabel on her pamphlet, Ripe. Um, better show it, haven't I? There we go. Um, as an editor, uh, Isabel was great to work with because she was keen to receive feedback and commentary on her work, while she also really had a clear sense of what she was trying to say in the poems, um, how she wanted to say it, and she wasn't afraid to make decisions based on her own instincts. So that kind of combination made it uh, just a pleasure uh, working with her. Whilst the poems in the pamphlet have remarkable range and detail, you'll have seen if, if you've got a copy and you'll see if you get one, um, and they deal with numerous topics, they cluster really around the themes of hunger and desire in really compelling ways. Uh, and they're thrilling to hear and uh, hear read, as, as you'll find out in a second, and to read yourself. Um, they're also ambitious, they're not just in terms of their content and their expression, but in terms of their form. This is the most formally ambitious pamphlet that we've published so far. And again, you, you get a real sense of that if you open it and have to have a look through the pages. Several of the poems, uh, and maybe Isabel will say something about this, went through some quite extensive revision during the editing process. And Isabel has, has talked actually about that as well on, on one of those interviews that I mentioned. Um, she's worked tremendously hard uh, and with fantastic attention to her craft to shape this pamphlet. And I am so pleased uh, that we were able to publish her work. So. Congratulations, Isabel, and let's over to you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, Neil, for that lovely introduction. Um, in my own way, I just want to return everything that you said. Thank you for everything. The process of working with you as an as a as a writer um, has just been amazing. You were so supportive all the time, um, so encouraging, so helpful, so patient. Um, and you paid so much, like you said, you know, you really engaged with me on all the ideas and helping me to bring all of them out and to make sure that the pamphlet was right and that it could be something I'm proud of. And I, I'm grateful to say that I am. So thank you. Um, so many people that I would wanna thank as well. I'll just say briefly, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Les, for all your feedback and support. Thank you to the entire team for helping to put this um, lovely pamphlet together. I, I love it. And yeah, thank you to Daniel and Kostya for all your support as well. I really have felt this whole way through that we're in it together and I'm really happy to be published alongside both of you. Daniel, your poems were stunning. I love the way you capture landscapes and your poem, Change of Knowledge, that was my favorite of the ones you read tonight. And I can't wait to revisit all your poems uh, when I read the pamphlet. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone for coming as well. So the pamphlet um, is called Right. And as Neil said, the primary theme is hunger. So I'm really thinking about 
the desires and needs that propel us through life and what they are and how they define us and who they lead us towards and who they lead us to become and what it costs to be gratified or to uh, pursue that gratification and what that can be like. So there's a lot of connections, hopes, desires, but then there's also ambivalence and destruction and uh, disappointment. And it covers a range of, the poems cover a range of different themes. So I'll just read a few from it tonight. The first poem that I'll read is called Finding My Dad in a Can of Baked Beans. Uh, my dad is from South Africa, and when I was a child, he used to play this song called In Kanyezi uh, Nezazai, or Nezazi. I'm sure I've messed that up. I, I don't speak Zulu, unfortunately. Uh, it, it's a song by Lady Smith Black Mombazo, and translated, it means the star and the wise man. So, and in the 90s, I should mention that it, the song was used in a baked beans ad. I don't know if anyone remembers that. No one that I've come across has remembered it, but I, it was seemed pretty iconic at the time. So anyway, this is Finding My Dad in a Can of Baked Beans. In supermarket aisles, you teach me to knead. Stacking cans up to my chin, baked beans, corned beef, carrots, peas. I heave our trolley against the weight of a fear you have never unlearned. At night, your prodigal car lights creep across my bedroom wall, and I add you to my list of things that come to us tightly sealed. On school runs, I plant tiny feet in the back of your driver's seat, hoping you'll feel something. Beanstalk tall and paraffin scarred, Google Translate says your laugh means wandering echo. And me, your youngest bean, if I knew the way back, I'd bury scoops of me for you to find. In the Bantustan near your mother's house, the chirp of grasshoppers saturating the bush in the tracks on sloping road made by your father's dusty Navarra, in the belly of the mine that swallowed your brothers every night. The first time I hear your language, it's in the song of a baked beans ad. White families rush through drizzling streets to huddle in kitchens, kicking kitchens, fall into dining room chairs. Uniformed, backpacked kids drift home to the baritones of Lady Smith Black Mombazo. You've played that song on the stereo. I don't know the words, but you say it's about wise men who cross the world looking for home in a man they have always hungered for. At the table, I nudge beans around my plate, clustering stars, trying to navigate the miles between us. At the window, the sides of the curtains shine like the rim of a half open can. In the pauses between ads, we chew on silence. Um, the next poem that I'll be reading is called PG Tips. Um, it's, a, it's about the experience, an experience of postnatal de depression and it's, in, it's, sorry, it's inspired by the experience of a family member of mine. Um, and I, as I was writing, I was just trying to sort of understand what that experience might have been like and how it would have impacted their understanding of themselves and their relationship with their child and their relationship with their family because certain experiences, they have echoes, they leave traces. And so I was following this, um, this echo back to its origin and trying to sort of understand and pinpoint um, how this relationship started, I suppose. And so this is PG Tips. Because she came from me, they all conclude I can be trusted. I take her. Outside, clouds shove past for a chance to peek and gush. Home still stands, the color of ash with smears from windy hands. 20 stories stacked like bread, the crust keep us from falling. The flat is barely big enough to swing her. The walls licked gray by silence. On the balcony, bloodied sheets tantrum the line. In the corner, behind a washing machine, with rust like snot on a toddler's nose, a pigeon squats in cigarette butts and scraps of chip shop paper. The egg beneath her trembles. The chick is trapped inside. Cut it out. When everyone else sleeps, I hear the pigeon's anxious coos. I want to whisper, I know, I know, but who knows who might be listening? In an alley, 
foxes scream the night apart. In a clawed out somewhere else, perhaps, I am. When it rains, the asphalt gleams like cupra nickel. And I think about every 50p coin that struck with a hundred tons of force before it's considered worthy. And I put a rose with thorns by her cot so she'll know what the world is like. Like bathing with the light off, surrendering to the dark. Like cracked skin offered up to a merciless mouth. Like the custard cream that says, I'm at my packet's end and crumbles. Like the toy car peeking from under the sofa, flinching when words smash against the wall. When we're born, we're someone else's. In the end, we are not our own. Our scents follow us round like whining children. Our faucets weep all day, some days. Then for weeks, nothing. September sighs, conquers quarrel, break up. Poplar leaves like tiny hands rest gently on my arm. On the bus, the bell assures me, this will all stop soon. The wheels go round, the body floods with ache. Cut it out. A midwife comes to check. On me, on her, to see who's winning. She drowns a tea bag right in front of me. When she turns, I bite a hole in it. Give the leaves a chance to get away. Um, okay, the next poem that I'm going to read is called Hot Boxing. Um, for those of you who are unaware, hot boxing is essentially when a person or a group of people will smoke marijuana in an enclosed space in order to trap the smoke and intensify the high. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so this is hot boxing. Bashir is the last to come. Air Force One's mud black and sinking wet through mildew carpet. Outside the, outside, the night bleeds on, flashing and blue. But here, in a B&B's back room, with earwax walls and dirty light, dangling webs and wallpaper collapse in a weary heap. One street from the cell block where Masadi slept last week. Four stops from the fly trap where Amari was deported. Between the pub and the job centre, in the lee of an underground track exposed and whining whenever it's railed. Here we use a towel, cloud coloured, cough rough, to seal the door. Soak it till it dives to black, drench it with the things that we once stretched on toes like children to reach. The spit of our mother's thumb against our cheeks, the froth of our father's beer, the blue of our brother's too soon breathless blood. Bashir was stopped and searched on his way over. Forged papers score his rectum, scar the parts no missile could reach, deliver him from Felton, where the plague is serving eight to ten for a block of coke and Hakim's blood on his shoes. The Union Jack flies from the neighbor's window, clouds the moon, colonizes its light. In solidarity with the shadow, we eclipse ourselves, harnessing the flames we've swallowed and promised a white to blacken a ream to burn. Bashir crinkles blue Rizla and green bush under my nose, tells me to lick it, I do. Says I got hands for rolling, I do. We light up and the papers curl back sneering. And we, six on a bed, a block of shame, each shade of night. We dig into each other, elbow deep. Jay shows me the shell behind his molar, the gulf between his knuckles, the cure behind his fly. I breathe and this old cloud remembers you, knows the weight that deflates your chest, sighs the ways you have tried to fill yourself. A comic watches us through the TV, jokes about a black hole that looks like our neighborhood. Mossadi laughs, a cluttered choke on truths too hard to swallow. We lick the bitter film on our lips. We pilgrim to blue flame and withered leaves. We ready for our door to be kicked in, for ash to scatter. We practice smiles the papers wouldn't print. We wield limbs heavy as blocks and dutty grind to forget how hollow. We are so cool, we let it burn our fingers, singe our lips. We are so fly, we spider ourselves in twists of spit that we pass round. And when we taste ourselves for what we are, we blow and laugh. Our senses cloud. The guys unzip, 
unleashing the rank warmth of boys and bowels poking through gashes, oozing untouched girls, bougie and black, a gasping kind of easy, powdered with blue eyeshadow and bubblegum shellac calling back the mules to count the papers in their hooves, to gather up the white dust in their fur. Too buzzed to go back to the tower block, the estate downwind from the sewage plant, where the refuse of the rest of the world becomes our drinking water. In summer, smell hot shit, dead foxes, fly tip trash from uptown shops. At least, so saith Jay, apothecary in the corner, with conspiracies of lizard queens and corporate logos hid in clouds of cockroaches who scour black bags for ciphers. A motorbike brings chicken, lamb, gin, blue curacao. The oil so hot it sizzles, the ceiling licked by steam. We wet their zoots until their paper droops. We splendor in their grade A grass and blow into the parts that they want numb. Someone blocks the door and they become our anchors when we start to fly. They twirl our baby hairs with fingers, hold them down when they're too drowsy to stand. Tomorrow, when other girls finger our edges, beg the same. We'll say it costs the price of an eight and the firm patter of rain from clouds they'll blow over their own heads. Um, okay, so the next poem is called, Can I Throw This One Away and Start Again? Um, the pamphlet explores a lot of different topics, and one of them is uh, sexual assault. And this poem explores the resurgence of trauma through memory and its impact over time. Straddling you, my tongue pries your lips open. Knowing you'll one day leave, I leave my taste there. My world immediately sours. I once flew to an island with a dozen girls I couldn't stand. At dinner, I felt a wound inside me open, a kind of dying wombic hope that I had not expected. I downed Uzo and Suv Lucky to staunch it. But when I stood to leave, I was the only one who couldn't see I was bleeding. Sometimes I would trudge through campus drizzle, pull up my red hood lying open in the wood and still, no wolves came. Buoyed up to the surface of a vodka rivered dream by the boy pulling my jeans around my ankles, nudging thoughts of me into the sun, hoping they'll bloom. Ivy only clings because the wolf smiled, asked to keep in touch. Shadows only crawl because they've seen our lowest parts. A security guard follows me through boots and I fidget my arms, not my fingers, not knowing how to tell him I have nothing, nothing in my hands. Or that every time I have ever smiled, my mother was holding the corners of my mouth. Or how just now in a public bathroom, I stepped on a scrap of toilet tissue, begging it to stick. It refused to hold on to me. I want to talk about following crumbs from midnight feasts at sleepovers, how even little girls forage the night. I want to talk about heaviness. I want to talk about wanting dark and the light that exists itself upon me each morning. Or the fact that, and for this I take the blame, because I made myself sweet on your tongue, I was easy for you to devour. And I think the final poem that I'll read tonight um, will hopefully have a slightly lighter, more hopeful tone. Um, this is called Simon Peter and it explores some of the deep questions that and desires that many of us feel and experience. Um, and it looks at the world with a kind of sense of hope and exploration. So this is called Simon Peter. <laughs> And when the darkness rises to our necks, we dive into it, waiting for a fin, a wind, a tug from a place less weighty. Our moon is always full, our boats are hungry. The sail stirs in the air, the sea waves yawn against the shore. I have drunk from tepid doctrines all this time, hauled brackish words with callous hands, sieved prophecies like wheat, 
been sunk by brothers holding down and the shade of our father's turned face. In darkness, we are all the same, shadows seeking flesh on which to feed. We ask the mist why it clings, the cliffs who carves them. And I, my brother's brother, I feel the truth but cannot catch it. I hear the words beneath this boat thrashing under weakest wood to flood our empty vessel. When ripples meet, they ask, who is your master? Which finger drew you? From whose touch are you running? If the hand was not worthy of praise, they melt in shame. And yet, when you sleep on a rocking tide, you will dream of your father's arms. And when the clouds break hands, you will face a fire peering from heaven and you'll dive into the deep to hide from it. But the fire will not consume you and the water will not drown. And when the current spits you out, lands you in your father's arms, his eyes will swim across your face and ask, who is your master? Which hand drew you? By whose touch are you reborn? This veil of sea, dividing life from we who prey upon it. What is man but the one who pierces it? This surface, bending light into the swallowing tide below. What could be more divine than to walk upon it? Um, and I think that's my time, so thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Isabel, for that beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, my name's Claire Cox. Uh, I help um, Neil out in the uh, Poetry Centre. And one, one of the jobs I have is to um, sift some of the um, poetry competition entries that uh, Neil's already mentioned. Uh, and I was doing that with great efficiency, uh, I think it was last year, the, you know, sort of little all that. And I came across uh, a poem that I had to read and then I came across the next poem that I also read, and there were about five of them that I just went, there, there is something here that speaks across, um, you know, uh, yeah, speaks across to me. So it was absolutely no surprise when Kostya, the lovely Kostya, actually won the EAL category as judged by Jackie Kay. Um, and, and it also, um, completely told me that my radar was was quite right and and that there was and that was a privilege to work with Kostya um who is genuinely lovely even even when he's kind of in Greece going oh well, yeah excuse me I've just got to uh, move away from the swimming pool and into the shade of the olives um yes and then I'll talk about poetry too um that's a slight a slight caricature uh, but no it's it was an absolute delight to work with him uh, on his amazing poetry, and I've been thinking about what kind of what it was that 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 quality that so engaged me. And I think I think I've come down to the, that it's a candor. Kostya has a candor and an openness and a translucence which really comes off the page. I think, um, and I was um, foolish enough to think, oh, that's it's quite simply constructed. And then I edited it with him and found out that actually it's an exquisitely composed working beating heart. And in the, um, in the pamphlet that is um, called Ephibos, uh, it was called something else before, but no, it's called Ephibos now. Uh, there is a book about um, Kostya's father's watch, Kostya's family and his family relationships and his, his cultural background mean a great deal to him obviously, but, but it struck me that, that actually what I love about his poetry um, and his, um, yeah, how it all comes out is that, that it, his poetry is, a, it's like his father's watch. It's a beautiful ticking piece uh, that, that, that moves in time with his heart and I just love it. So please, Kosti, can you share your wonderful poetry with us? Um, and again, thank you to all the poets uh, this evening. It's been such a privilege. Thank you, Kostya. Claire, thank you so much for your kind and beautiful words. If anything, my heart is ticking really fast right now because uh, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, but thank you so much for your kind words. And also thank you, Isabel and Daniel, for your beautiful readings tonight. 
Um, I've already read lots of your poems, which I admire, and I can't wait to, to read Ripe and Long Iron. Uh, congratulations on the publication. It's, a, it's an honor to be uh, your press mate. Um, it is a dream, a long, a long dream I've had to get a book published. When I was 18, I didn't really expect it would be poetry, <laughs> but it's happened. Um, and I'm really happy uh, tonight to be reading from it. Um, many of the poems in the pamphlet uh, go back five years, but I would say the, the seed out of which they have sprouted goes even further. I've read really early drafts of a novel I was writing ages ago, and I realized quite a few ideas have actually gone into poems. Um, despite that, despite how long ago some of these ideas came to me, it only it took me until this summer to realize that quite many of my poems are an attempt of reconciliation, uh, not only with the place, the, the city and the country I, I grew up in, I was born in, Athens in Greece, uh, which to borrow Daniel's expression with which I have a deep connection, both good and bad. Um, but it's a place that I go back to uh, as a happier adult and can sort of fix my relationship with it in a way because I just couldn't wait to leave it when I was a closeted, lonely teenager back in the uh, shock horror 90s. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from Ephibos, which means teenager in Greek. There's a few other ideas around that word that deal with classical Greece, but I'm not going <laughs> to go into detail about these. Uh, but before I read, I would like to very much uh, thank and express my gratitude to the Ignition Press team, uh, Brooks Poetry Centre in Oxford. Uh, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Les. But above all, thank you, Claire Cox, for your patience and friendship and RuPaul talks through the past six months. It's been great. And also thank you to everyone who has <laughs> helped make this dream of mine come true. Thank you very much. So here are a few poems from Ephibos. And we'll start from the very beginning of the pamphlet, which in my head is also the very beginning in general. <clears throat> Bathroom in an Athens suburb, 1994. All I have are catalogues from archeological museums, page after page of glossy athletes, gods and heroes in bronze or marble, some missing limbs, noses, heads, others full-bodied. At first, I'm happy to look, flick through the fractured perfections. Soon, growing bolder, I will them off their pedestals, let them stretch after millennia of holding celebrated poses, grant them heart, a pulse, sinew and permeable skin. Grateful, they let me touch them. Trembling, I examine the scars dug by the plows of farmers and fishermen's anchors. I close my eyes, smell the earth that clings to the tangled hair of those found in muddy fields the hint of iodine in the sweat of those raised from ancient shipwrecks. Ignore the ochre scent of my mother's cosmetics on the wicker shelf. No one will knock and ask what I'm doing locked behind this door. I don't want to come out. There are summer nears. It gets harder and harder to breathe. Antlers. I catch my father admiring them on the boys who live in our block, boys who bellow at each other on the basketball court who fill their cars with petrol or work in tight blue jeans at the taverna in the park. My schoolmates carry theirs with pride, true bone, rising from stiff gelled heads. I know my neck could not stand the weight. Vitamins 
and vats of milk can't make mine grow. Still small as thumbs, even coating them in honey mixed with blood will not work. I watch the boys strut around the schoolyard, how they always compare scars, size each other up, how a playful slap in the face escalates into rutting, into twisting violence, pulled up shirts, exposing lean, winter pale waists, sweating bodies and antlers intertwined. Next poem is the one that won the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Competition last year in the ESL category. Um, as an ESL poet, English, you know, poet writing in English as a second language, I'm grateful to Oxford Brooks for uh, treating it as an equal category in its competition. And I'm also grateful to Jackie Kay for offering it first place in the competition. Neil sent me an email about it when I won. It was about 11.30 in the evening when I did and just couldn't sleep <laughs> for the rest of the night. So thanks, Neil, for, getting, for keeping me so groggy <laughs> on that Friday day at work. Photographs. On balconies, in sunlit rooms, embracing relatives I never met, holding long dead pets. My parents' youth is kept in the living room, in a wooden chest. Deckled prints no bigger than my palm, formal studio portraits and light starved slides span monochrome decades, peaking in codder gold right before I was born. Again and again, my parents are caught ignorant of me. Dad, nearing 90 now, his mouth a sparrow that no longer flies. How can he be the smart lieutenant mum has yet to fall for? His uniform, a brilliant white, he can't be trusted with today. Mum, her eyes dimmed by limitations and disappointment. Is she the girl? stem thin in a little black dress gazed at by pomaded suitors. Even then she felt like a displaced floor tile, but in that girl's beautiful, composed face, there's no hint of the anxious woman watching now in terror as the core light of life without him leaks in like a new development from under the door. Totality, solar eclipse, Crete, 11 August, 1999. The car's an incubator, even with the windows down, squashed in the back of the boxy rental. I'm taller than both my parents. Radio says today we'll hit 40 degrees. We're too far south to wow at the diamond ring for the sky to dim. Pacing the water's edge in the brooding heat, the clammy nylon of my swim shorts clings. I kick and kick the breathless sea. Next month, I can learn to drive, buy alcohol, gamble. Next month, I'll find my cool release in the shadows of England's parks. Next month. Next month. Now in this poem, just a small note, the Greek uh, translates as he's in one piece. The watch. I sold it, got less than I hoped. Enough to last me two months, three, if careful. Loveless, sleepless weekends on strangers' loop grease sofa beds. I promised Dad I'd give it to the son I'd name after him. The phantom shackle around my wrist. I catch glimpses of it in old photographs, shuffle through them quickly. 
the images ticking against my fingertips. My surname means one armed or handicapped. Unkind nickname turned family name. Dad always gave money to the one armed beggar at the traffic lights. I think of him, the village cripple for how, from how many hundred years ago? I carry his Y chromosome. At my birth, the surgeon cried out, Artimelis. The dealer said the clasp would have to be changed. Alpha, Delta, Taf, engraved in beautiful cursive. A hundred quid struck off for each of dad's initials. Naming it. We sweat all night, soak our beds, fill wards, spill out of hospitals, slurry the roads. We die under dripping awnings, in tavern yards, in barns. Our cries cut deeply into the skin of hearing. Doctors name it after us. Kids add it to the things you catch in tag. They say God brought it down, that it came in a foreign ship, that you catch it shaking hands, sharing cups. People in high places get it. Holy men, teachers, national treasures, after a hundred deaths on stage. Those who haven't rush past us, bolt their doors, seal their heavy windows. Leaders tell us they are on it. That doctors spend all day and night looking for a cure. But really, they are busy with diplomacy with how the nation looks abroad. And all the while, our shrouded corpses carpet the steps of government, and we run out of paper to list our dead. So I've got two last poems to read. Um, the next one is dedicated in the memory of the lad, 20 year old lad I'm, talking, I'm writing about in this poem who, um, was practically bullied to death for not fitting in. The case of Vangelis Yakumakis after Kavafi. In this muddy ditch, overlooked by naked branches, lies the decomposing body of Vangelis, a Cretan. He studied at the Dairy Academy nearby. Missing for 37 days, he was sighted all over Greece at once. The press described him as sensitive, a loner. Bullies slapped him while he ate. When he showered, they turned the water off. Someone kicked him down a flight of stairs. Someone locked him in a closet, made him sing for hours. Then the video, six sniggering guys piling on top of him. Thousands heard Vangelis beg please stop, you're hurting me. His voice, smaller than an olive. All this was recorded. So was the knife found at his side. What's lost are his features, the smooth flesh on his cheek, where his mother would kiss him goodbye. And the final poem opens up a slightly more optimistic, <laughs> part of the pamphlet, I assure you, it's not all very dark, um, because that's, I think, where the reconciliation in my heart starts in my life. Sparrow. The day before the royal wedding, rainbow flags jostle for air with Union Jack bunting. Hurrying up or Compton Street, I phoned my father. From neon posters, near naked boys invited me to all weekend long parties at the clubs. Every stranger I passed looked happier than me. I cried so much the night before, said perhaps I can send my yaya. Two floors down from their flat, she could tell them over breakfast. I could picture her doing it. Pink dressing gown over her nightdress, 
light-footed in her fluffy slippers, the angel with a message. If it came out of her mouth like a velvet ribbon, surely they couldn't turn their faces from it. My mother looking at her scrambled eggs as if they were vomit. I said to dad, we could no longer live like this. And in my ear, dad said, it's all right. In the careful voice I'd heard him use when talking to sparrows, those curious little things, so easy to frighten, that would perch hollow bone on the railing as he tended his delicate balcony plants. Thank you everyone who joined us tonight and thank you for listening and thank you Ignition Press and Isabel, Daniel, congratulations. Thank you so much, Costio. It was a fantastic reading. Uh, all three of you have been uh, terrific, tremendous readings. Thank you, all three. And, and again, thank you so much for, for allowing us to share your work uh, like this. Uh, and particular thanks to uh, Claire and Les as well, and to all of you uh, who have been uh, watching. Um, this uh, recording will be available on YouTube. Um, so if you uh, want to watch it again, or you want to invite other people to watch it, please do let them know. Thank you uh, to all of you who have been chatting entering your messages into the chat, where if the poets haven't seen them, we'll share it with them. Um, it's really appreciated. It's great to, uh, even though we can't actually see you, to know that you are there. Uh, and given you could have been doing all kinds of other things this evening, uh, like finding out how many votes were left in Philadelphia, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you've turned up uh, and listened to the poets. If you want to track down the pamphlets, um, there will be a link in the chat that you can uh, find and click on, um, or just search for Ignition Press. Uh, the Poetry Centre and you'll be able to find the pamphlets and we hope very much that you will uh, buy them and enjoy them. If you can join us on the 19th, same kind of format, um, look on the Poetry Centre Facebook, Instagram or Twitter to find out more about um, the International Poetry Competition Awards or just send me an email and I'll send you a link to that as well. Um, but for now, thank you so much for joining us.